Welcome back to another Bible reading, guys. We are so happy that you are here. This is Reading Exodus. Uh, for all of you that are joining us from the last week's episode, I hope that you have already hit that subscribe button. If you haven't, make sure you do so. We will be going through the entire Bible in the course of who knows how long this is going to take. <laughs> uh, but as you know, if you've been doing this with us, we don't really talk much. We go right back into it because uh, it's just reading the Bible. So let's dive back in where we left off at Exodus chapter 5. My brother JD is going to take Take over and uh, let's see what the word of God has for us. Amen. Amen. So Exodus chapter five, we ended off with Exodus chapter four last week. And we see Moses is being instructed to return to Egypt and to let God's people go. So chapter five, afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Let my people go, and they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go. A th uh, let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to our Lord, our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many and you may and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the, task master, uh, the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it. For they are idle. So I mean, this again, just just quickly going to stop here. Um, this is again we've we've we often get this in apologetics. Mike and I talk about this all the time. Pharaoh's hardened heart. We see God hardening Pharaoh's heart. This is obviously uh, a big question that comes up when we speak to atheists, and they're like, "Well, why did God do that?" Yeah, we see this in itself is an example of a hardened heart. And look what Pharaoh is doing. He's hardening his heart, not only toward God, but toward God's people. So we see these examples, and it's very important to take note of this as we get to the final crux where God gives him over to what he already desires. Amen. Therefore, they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they sh that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, thus says Pharaoh. So notice here, yeah, thus says the Lord, thus says Pharaoh. So we see that we see the same thing, um, the mimicking. I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you find it. But your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, complete your work, your daily task each day, as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? Then the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks, and behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, you are idle, you are idle. That is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. I mean, this is just insane. If you look at it from, from, from a modern day perspective, like I need you to build a house. 
I need you to do this. You've got X amount of time to do it, but I'm not providing you any of the material to build what I'm requesting you to build. You've got to go out and hunt and find this material. Again, oh, dude, he's being see. super petty right now. I mean, if you yeah. really think about it, he's mad that, you know, because the little subtle hints at like, oh, well, since you got this extra time because you're asking me to go serve your God, since you have all this extra time, why don't you go get your own straw? Go get your own yeah. stuff. And I'm going to make your work exactly. harder. Like he's straight up. <laughs> if I, yeah, if this wasn't a family like a friendly child. home, a family, family friendly podcast right now, I would say some <laughs> choice words. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he's literally acting like a spoiled brat and simply because he's, he doesn't want to, not only does he want to give, give into the request of letting the people go, but now he's just, he's just got bitter towards it. He's, he's like, you know what? I'm going to show you, you come to me with this request and now I'm just going to be like extra. <laughs> and the thing about exactly it is, is, is also his pride because he doesn't want to acknowledge another God. That's what, you know, he starts this by saying, you know, who is this God for me to really like yeah. worry about him? And cause you know, Pharaoh is God in their, in, in the yeah. Egyptian culture, the Pharaoh is God or, or, uh, you know, born of God and therefore he's God in physical form, whatever it may be. But you know, he's not trying to show any type of respect to the real God. So yeah, he's being prideful. Amen. Amen. So it says, go now and work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks as we saw in verse 18. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh and they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants. You have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Notice this as well as we finish here. Just put that one on a shelf for a second. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil things to this people and you have not delivered your people at all. So, why I said, let's put that on a shelf for a second. Oh Lord, why have you done? Like, look at this, right? So immediately, and even today in, in modern day Christianity, modern day Christians, we have this, this thing about us where if anything bad happens, if anything goes wrong, we immediately go like, what do we do to deserve this God? Like, this isn't fair. Like, now we've got to work harder. Now we've got to, and, and, and we see that God's ultimate plan is for deliverance of Israel in a way that they've never known. But even so, even so we see, yeah, the, the moaning and complaining immediately starts with what have we done to deserve this? And when we go back uh, to, I think it was uh, chapter three, maybe no chapter three and four. So, Moses was just told by God that you're going to go, you're going to ask, and he's going to say no to you. So it's not like Moses should be surprised at all. If we all yeah. remember last week's reading. Amen. Um, I can't remember exactly where it's at, uh, but he tells Moses, like, you're going to go, he's going to say no, then you're going to do this, and, and then you're going to do this, and then you're going to do this. And like he walks him through the whole plan. And yet yeah. somehow, again, man being man, just like Abraham was told, don't worry, I'm going to give you a kid. And then he did what he did. Man can know exactly what God says to them and still our sinful nature in us causes us to, you know, stumble. And these men saw God, these men walked with God, these men spoke Amen. with God, you know? So when we're, when we're condemning ourselves cause we made mistakes or we, you know, we did something we shouldn't have done today. That is a part of your nature. It's not an excuse, but it's also not a reason for you to beat yourself up and condemn yourself more than God condemns you. Yeah, I, you know, I think like like when and then this is this is just JD's opinion. If we look at all the Old Testament prophets and we, as we go through, I, I feel like David really grasped the concept, and 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 so did Solomon. Like you, when it comes to if God said it, then God will do it, and and he knew. Like David, and we look at we're going to get there, but ultimately we see that. If God has said something, then it will it will come to pass. And very much the same way we see modern day Christians today, like walk around with the doubt of 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 praying and oh, 
warm-up prayers be answered and reading scripture and thinking that the the reading of the scripture has no effect on the hearers but ultimately we see this from the prophet isaiah that that nothing not one word of god will proceed forth and not achieve what he has set it out to achieve amen beautiful yeah i mean yeah it's it's our society of Christianity, we do this all the time, is doubting of God. And you pointed it out. David was one that no matter what, he trusted God. You know, he was the man after God's own heart. The one thing yeah. that David didn't do compared to the rest of the Old, Test- uh, the Old Testament people is he didn't fall to idolatry. So no matter how yeah. much David sinned, he always knew Yahweh was God and he always aimed at Yahweh. He always pursued oh, God um, and he Amen. was after his heart. And that's why David has that special place of, uh, to the Lord. All right, so let's see, chapter six. But the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. That's interesting that he points out that he appeared to Isaac, Jacob, and Abraham, but he never gave his name to them. Moses was the first he gave his name to. Um, Mm. Verse 5, Moreover, I have heard the groanings of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. I don't know why this sticks out to me right now more than it normally does because we, we see this all throughout scripture, but right now it hits me a little bit different. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I have went through those moments where you think God's maybe not listening. Um, and, and like JD just said, sometimes we doubt the truth that God said he will listen, but then we, we go through those moments like, where are you at God? And I bet there were people in Egypt saying that. In fact, we know that yeah. because they just got mad at Moses saying, what's going on, man. But see God saying here, like I hear the groanings of the people. So God hears you. And, and what this tells me is while you think that everything is in the worst situation it can be and you're groaning saying, where are you Lord? He might be in the background working out that plan, making things, uh, you know, get to where they need to get to so that everything falls into place, but we just don't know it. We don't know what's happening in the background. So trust him because as we know now, the Egyptians had nothing to worry about. Really? (laughs) God had them. Well, not the Egyptians, the Egyptian slaves, I should say. Uh, Okay. And I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you. I I love the fact that there's three I wills here. It's not, um, you know, it's not, it's it's not conditional. You know, people often talk about like how the Old Testament is about law and the Jews had to keep the law to be saved and all this stuff. That's actually not true. What you're going to learn here, especially in Exodus, is God saves before we have any requirements. Just like today, like people act like this saved by grace through faith alone is a new thing. No, that's these The Egyptians have done nothing to earn being saved. Not the Egyptians. I keep calling them that. (laughs) The Jews in Egypt have done nothing to be saved. They did not do anything. While we were enemies, he saves us. This is not new. It's it's happened before. It just happened perfectly with us. And and Mm -hmm. this is foreshadowing of it. But God's saying, I will redeem you. I will uh, uh, take you out to be my people. I will bring you out from under the burdens. I will deliver you. I will be your God. I will nothing here Man. says, and you need to do this and you need to do that. And you need to do this. So just, just also put this one on the shelf. The next time you hear an atheist or, or anyone outside of the faith say that your God was for slavery, just, just pin this Exodus chapter six from verse six. And, and, and you can, you can, what our God is for slavery. Really? I hear the groanings of my people. I will deliver them. I will, I will, I am the Lord, your God. So God has never been pro slavery. Again, this is just an example of not everything that is pre that, that everything is prescribed by God as, and as described in the Bible is prescribed by God. Sorry. 
and and we've gone over this, Mark, and I've gone over this many, many times, is, is the Bible is a book of true authority, and it speaks truth even in the bad things. Yeah, it doesn't exactly. admit the bad things. It tells yeah. the truth. You know, PSA here, guys, humanity is not a pretty thing. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Human history is, is bloody, ugly, and evil. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that it, I wouldn't want the book that, that edits that out and doesn't tell me about David cheating on his wife. Doesn't tell me about, uh, you know, Moses committing murder because that's a false book that, that keeps all the dirty out, leave the dirty in yeah. because nothing can make God dirty. Um, Amen. so yeah, so I will, I will, I will, I will no requests on God be on God's behalf yet. Let's start at verse, uh, you know, uh, seven here. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord, your God. Notice also he ends it by saying, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God. So he's not even, our God doesn't need to demonstrate anything for us. He doesn't need to prove anything, but he's like, I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to enact my power. I'm going to do all this. And you will know that I am who I say I am because he's a God of order, a God of structure a righteous God. And these parts of his attributes, this is why it's so important guys to read all the Bible, especially the old Testament. Like, let this be a Testament to you right here to know God is to know all of him, not just the parts that make you feel Man. fluffy inside like Romans, uh, you know, 12, be not conformed to the world. And then, you know, Isaiah 44, where God says, mm -hmm. I love you to mm -hmm. his people. We are called to know who God is, and God is a God of order. If you know who God is, you can spot falsehoods a lot easier. I guarantee you that. Not That'll right. preach, Let's bro. That's That'll it. preach. That'll do, pig. That'll do. That'll preach, brother. That'll preach. And I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So these words fall on deaf ears. And I think we all can understand that a little bit because they're being, they're receiving this message from a guy and to them, they're being beaten and tortured and, and mistreated and abused. And that's probably a rough thing to hear from someone. So the Lord said to Moses, go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. <clears throat> Now, uh, it's going to jump into the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. Uh, so again, this is the weird thing that happens sometimes in the Bible. And I know for you guys, we talked about it. It's sometimes it's just necessary that we go through it because this is historical narrative. These are the heads of their father's houses, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. These are the clans of Reuben, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jemin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Sha'al, the son of the Canaanite women, woman. These are the clans of Simeon. <clears throat> These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations. Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, the years of the life of the Levi being 137 years. The sons of Gershon, Libni, and Shemai, by their clans. The sons of Kohath, Amram, Izha, Hebron, and Uziel. The years of the life of Kohath being 133 years. The sons of Morari, Mali, and Mushi. They, uh, these are the clans of the Levites according to their generations. Amram took as his wife Joshebeb, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. The years of the life of Amram being 137 years. The sons of Izar, Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. The sons of Uziel, Mishael, El Zaphan and Sithri, Aaron took as his wife Elisheba, the daughter of Amenadab, and the sister of Nashan, and she bore him Nadad, Abihu, Elizar, and Ithamar, the sons of Korah, Asir, Elkanah, and Abiasaf. These are the clans of the Korhites. 
Eleazar, Aaron's son, took as his wife one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phinehas. These are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites by their clans. These are the uh, these are the Aaron and Mo- these are the Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, "Bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their hosts." So what we see right here is this moment in Exodus where it's like, you keep hearing about Aaron and Moses. Let's go ahead and make it clear who are Aaron and Moses. Where do they come from? What is their bloodline? And we know that's very important in the Bible again, and we've mentioned it many, 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 many times, but it is very important because of historical narrative, because of you know the bloodline of the Jews, the 12 tribes, all the way up to Jesus, we have genealogies. Let's continue here. Uh, they, these are Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their hosts. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the people of Israel from Egypt. This Moses and this Aaron. On the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said to the Lord, behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? So it's a very interesting chapter that kind of just gets dropped in there. Um, but like I said, it's necessary. It's it's something that we need uh, for the genealogies and to understand who Moses is and who Aaron is. And especially for those readers back then, they would have been able to understand that a lot better than you probably do. Yeah, amen. Amen, amen, amen. And again, genealogies might seem pointless, but this exactly, this explains the, the authenticity, um, of the historicity of the lineage. Um, and people, that's, that's, that's why it's in there. Um, can you trace back where it started? Yes, we can. How? Because it's been laid out very plainly for us. So chapter seven, and the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. And your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. Why? Because Moses said he's of uncircumcised lips. So he, meaning he's not he's not good. He's not good with speaking. He's he's got a problem with speech. He doesn't speak well. He is he's basically saying, yo, I'm not a public speaker. Like, how am I supposed to be the one who's 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 gonna deliver this message when you know that I, I do not do well with speaking in front of people? So God says, Don't worry, Aaron will be there. You shall speak all that I command you and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. There it is. Bam. What do we see in the first six verses? We see that Pharaoh has already been petty, already hardened his heart towards God, already been angry because he can't be God himself. This is what it comes down to. He is his own God and there is no other God but him. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. There again. So when God is giving this instruction to Moses and to and to Aaron, when Israel is complaining, like, why is this happening? Why is this happening? At that point, they should know, we know this is going to happen. God said this will happen. He said he won't listen. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my host, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old. Wrap your head around that for a second. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Like these are two grandpas, man. Yeah. <laughs> Grandpa, Moses, <laughs> Grandpa Moses and Grandpa Aaron are like, yo, Pharaoh, uh, it's time to let the people go, man. Uh, so I want, I want you guys to definitely highlight that 80 years old. And then I'm going to share with you. Um, oh, God, that's right. You can't see it when I'm screen sharing this way. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, in Acts 7.33, we see... Uh, Moses being spoken about by Stephen, I believe that this is right here. And he says in verse uh, 33, where's it at? Then the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Oh, that's not where I was supposed to go. 
Let me go back real quick and see what that cross reference was. My bad, guys. Look at me. Uh, Acts, oh, 723. 723. Yeah. My bad. That's when fun. he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wrong, he defended an, the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. So I told you guys this already, but I just want you to show, I want to show you why I, why I was able to say that. Moses begins this journey at 40. At 40 is when he murders the Egyptian and he leaves his, you know, home as being, you know, a, a part of the Egyptians and heads off to become a shepherd and have children and, and have this life. And here we are in Exodus when it's time to finally, you know, do what God had called him to do 40 years ago. He's now 80 doing it. So it's just uh, that there's that time of preparation. God grooms people to be who they need them, to, uh, who he needs them to be. And then I also wanted to point out something when JD was reading it. It says, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. And I think it's important to remember that because sometimes when we're talking with the atheists or, you know, antichrists that try and say God is evil and they talk about the things God has done, sometimes we as Christians can forget to say that was judgment. Like at the end of the day, God is the judge. He has the right to judge. And therefore, when he passes judgment, he's not wrong for doing so. Um, so it's not that God was just killing people for fun or punishing people for fun. He was punishing because they they deserved judgment. And now he holds off his judgment and gives us this time to repent. But we should be thankful and, and, and uh, you know, just on our knees praying, thanking God for the mercy that he has given us to postpone that judgment so that we may come to him and repent and, and be born again anew. But yeah, I just wanted to point that out that God's punishment upon people is judgment for the acts of evil that they have, the, uh, the idolatry that they have, because Egypt is extremely guilty. Even if you take away the fact that they have Hebrews as slaves, um, they are extremely guilty. For other things such as idolatry, having false gods, worshiping false gods, serving false gods. Um, and in fact, we're going to see that I believe we're going to see the Egyptian gods brought up uh, here in a little bit uh, throughout Exodus. So with that being said, uh, let me get let JD get back to it. Awesome. So then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle. Then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh and it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by the secret arts. So even here we see witchcraft and wizardry, nothing new. Uh, everyone that claims that the, this is what's happening, there's nothing new under the sun. As Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes, everything that has been will be. So they try and mimic, as the devil does even today, try and mimic everything that God does. For yeah. each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. So yeah, we see now, there that God's know, staff ain't no counterfeit, though. <laughs> yeah. God's staff is like, okay, sweet. I'm going to swallow up all these, um, as we see him do with all evil. And ultimately, now we're going to go into the, the plagues. Now we're going to start diving into those plagues. And this is, this is a result of what happens when we disobey um, God's direct instruction. Then the Lord said to Moses, verse 14, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. So there was speak of it will be hardened. And now it, it has taken place. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take your hand, the staff that turned into a serpent, and you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go and they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile and it shall turn into blood. 
The fish in the Nile shall die and the Nile will stink. The Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt and over the rivers, over the rivers, uh, sorry about that, and their, can uh, and their canals and their ponds and their pools of water so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. So all their drinking water basically tarnished, basically it's gone. It's now turned into blood. Moses and Aaron did as God commanded, did as the Lord commanded in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. He lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile and all the water in the Nile turned into blood and the fish in the Nile died and the Nile stank so that the Egyptians could not drink the water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened and he would not listen to them. As the Lord had said, Pharaoh turned and went into his house and he did not even take, he did not even, he did not take even this too hard, sorry. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for the water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. Seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. Amen. Amen. Um, so there's actually a lot of studies that go into uh, some stuff that happens behind the doors when it comes to these plagues, right? Not behind the doors. I mean, now we, let me not word it that way. But uh, for example, though, what I mean is, did you know that when, when we look at the 10 plagues, this is actually all these plagues coincide with gods of Egypt, right? Uh, for example, we just saw that the water in the Nile was turned to blood. The fish were killed. The Nile was basically disrespected. Well, Egypt had a god of the Nile whose name was Happy. Um, so the, he was the Egyptian god uh, of the Nile. So here is God basically saying, I have control over the Nile, not your god. Just want to throw it out there, and I'll point out the rest of them as we continue to go um, down this path. So here's chapter 8. Uh, then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with the frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and in the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frogs shall come up on you and on your people and on all of your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, and over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Uh, so for the Egyptians, uh, they, had a, they had a god called, uh, let me try and remember this one, uh, Heket. And this was the Egyptian goddess of fertility, and she was represented by a frog. If you're not aware of this, but uh, a lot of the Egyptian gods were represented by different animals. Uh, so we see that, you know, a second plague comes now, and we see God in control of the frogs, demonstrating, I'm in charge of everything you think your gods are in charge of. Uh, these 10 plagues are just as much about the false gods of Egypt as it is about punishing Pharaoh. Um, in fact, I believe at some point, uh, I, I don't know if we missed it, but God says, you know, I am punishing the gods of Egypt. I think, it, I don't think we've come across that yet, but we will. Also, uh, something I forgot to mention in the beginning of this as we dive into it, uh, numbers in the Bible, as we always talk about, very symbolic, have a lot of meaning. So 10 normally represents fullness and the 10 plagues uh, of Egypt can also be representative, uh, representative of a full plague. No, no partiality to it, complete, uh, just full-on uh, judgment of Egypt. Let's go ahead and continue, though. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, 
be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. And he said, tomorrow, Moses said, be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs shall go away from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did accordingly to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a risp- that, that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Now, real quick, I want to go to this word here, respite, in case it, it gro- drives any uh, uh, confusion here. This is a break, a clearing relief, right? So what, what it's saying here is Pharaoh basically is like, this is overwhelming. There's frogs everywhere. I mean, l- remember what it said about the frogs, that they would be piles on piles on piles, right? So that's, it's getting to him. So he says, I'll let the people go, get rid of these frogs. So then Moses gets rid of the frogs and suddenly Pharaoh's not really in, a, in need of the of of anything so he changes his ways again and look what it says he hardened his heart so again god might have hardened his heart in moments of this but pharaoh is fully deciding to harden his own heart as well throughout this now i do find something really interesting that if you look at the plagues there was a movie that came out that was completely unbiblical um so i'm not recommending this movie at all but whenever a movie comes out based on biblical stories i watch it i don't know if you ever saw You're it talking JD. about yeah gods and kings exodus yes but i do like one thing about it i think that the way that they presented the plagues was uh, kind of interesting that they kind of that god used it, it used natural things because if you look at this first he has the fish die in the water and therefore, uh, the, the water turns blood, right? So he kills the fish, yeah. water becomes blood. Well, then, because the water's blood, frogs don't want to swim in blood. So he then calls the frogs to leave the Nile and come upon the land, right? So they're leaving the blood. They're getting out of there. They're going into the land. Next, all the frogs die because God lets all the frogs die. And they said it says they pile them up and they stank. Well, the third plague is gnats. What would come from a bunch of dead like if there was a bunch of dead frogs, there would be a, a, a large plethora of gnats. Again, fully gnats God flies, involved yeah. in here. Uh, yeah. But I'm saying I did find it interesting how they kind of showed how, because, I mean, you have to ask the question, do you think God is making all these things appear out of thin air? Or because he is so sovereign, he can do this with the natural order of things, right? Like yeah. kill all these uh, these fish, which will bring forth these frogs, which when they die will bring forth these gnats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I digress. I digress. I'm going to get a yeah. shirt that says I digress on it because people have pointed out I say it a lot, but whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I, got the, I got the good chapter here, so I get, the, I get to have fun with all the plagues. The third plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. That's an interesting thing to point out here. I would highlight that. For the first couple plagues, the um, magicians, and, and let me just tell you this right now. When you think of magician, I hope you're not thinking of top hat with a bunny rabbit. We're talking about false prophets here, sorcerers, uh, evil men that, that serve false gods that get their power from false gods. And therefore, it's not good power. It's not, it's not ample power at all. And they were able to do a couple things that looked similar to what God did. They were able to make their staff look like a snake. God's staff ate it. They were able to, you know, produce a little bit of the red Nile as well. And they were able to produce some frogs. But now they're at this point where like, okay, they can't do this. They can't even come close to this because there's millions and billions of gnats being created right now. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So you might be saying, okay, Mike, well, which God is this, uh, you know, hurting? Because uh, I said that every one of these plagues is, is against a God. So in Egypt, 
they had a god named Geb, who was the Egyptian god of the earth. Now, pay attention what just happened. Uh, this is the Egyptian god over all dust of the earth. That's what he was known for. And God said, strike the ground and all the dust of the earth will become gnats um, in, in Egypt, right? So, again, God is not only rebuking Pharaoh, but he's disrespecting their false gods. Oh, you think you're in charge of this? You think you're in charge of that? So, let's keep going, though. The fourth plague, flies. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourselves to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go and they may serve me or else if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. Oh, this would bother me so much. I mean, just living in Texas, I feel like I can understand. <laughs> These flies begin on my nerves. I couldn't imagine this. Like Pharaoh tripping for you <laughs> being able to push through this one. I'm yeah. surprised, you know, I'm surprised God didn't send no mosquitoes. I feel like that would have ended it at plague number two. It's mosquitoes and pickles. Bro, as I go through this, sorry, like I know you are you mid-reading yet, but like as I go through these plagues, like you 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 touched on already, but when we read Romans three, Romans three, verse nine through twenty-three, and we see the the hardened heart condition. Um, it just shows, it just shows in its testament to that when your heart is hardened, um, and you've hardened your heart towards God. And, and this is oftentimes why I say to people, um, we look at second Timothy chapter two, um, which tells us very clearly that we should avoid, um, you know, conversations that are pointless, um, and, you know, irreverent babble with people that have hardened their hearts towards God, because it doesn't matter how much proof we provide. It doesn't matter how much truth we lay on the table. Their mm -hmm. hearts have been hardened. I mean, at the sight of this plague, you, you've seen blood, you've seen fish die, you've seen frogs, you've seen the lice, now come the flies. And you're still like, nah, nah, fam, I'm keeping these people working. I'm keeping them locked down. Like this is, this is purely a hard condition. And this is why Paul puts so much emphasis on this Romans one through three, that all men have fallen, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And we are by nature, by nature in our fallen state that we are opposed and opposition to the will of God. Just let that sink in. Yeah, in Romans 1, Paul says, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul says that they suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. So our unrighteousness is what hardens our heart. And I love that you brought that up, JD, because this is also a great reminder that <laughs> these people, like, like, like JD just said, they saw the power of God and they still said no. If you think that the, you can yeah. keep saying something and an atheist is going to be like, you know what? I was in full rejection of it, but you bring up a good point. No. It's, yeah. a, it's a hardened <laughs> it's heart, and only by the power of the Holy Spirit will they come to the Lord. Amen. Okay, let's see. Where was I at? Um, or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus, I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into the servants' houses throughout all the land of Egypt. The land was ruined by the swarm of flies. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said it would not be right to do so for the offering. We shall sacrifice to the Lord. Our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, they will not stone us. I mean, will they not stone us? We must go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord. Our God, as he tells us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. <laughs> this guy. This guy. 
Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to the sacrifice to the Lord. Like Moses trying to help him out. Like, hey, hey, listen to me. I'm, I'm telling you, you might not want to cheat again. You might not want to be, be lying right now. And the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Again, yeah. we see Pharaoh hardening his own heart. We see Pharaoh lying okay. to God twice. And yet, We'll let people jump to the end of this and be like, how dare God uh, 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 kill the firstborn of the Egyptians as if Pharaoh didn't have chance after chance after chance after chance. And it's like, mm. what did you want mm. God to do? Did you want God to say, well, you're not listening, so I'm going to let you do that. Atheists always be like, there's always a better way. They pretend they know how to be God better than God. And it's like, what's this other way? like teleport them out. You want him to teleport them out and do some fun. And then, and then it looks like God's kind of scared because let's not forget. God is also never going to let anybody. And I'm going to make this very clear. The Bible says God will not be mocked. So if you're expecting like, well, God's all powerful. He could just teleport them out of there and then no one gets hurt. Yeah. But that makes God look like a coward. That makes God look like he's scared to offend. And he's like, I'm just going to get my guys. And the God ain't going to do that. He's going to walk in the front door. He's going He's going to make it very clear. I am the Lord thy God. This is my people. This is my land. And I don't know why atheists think God has to coexist with us and obey some type of moral rules that they have. But mm. yeah, I mean, oh. this is, this is, a, I'm glad you said that because that's, that's something we have to touch on as we go through the Exodus. God is law. There is no law apart from God. So again, when we ask the question of, of moral absolutes, where morality comes from, if it isn't for God, we do not know how to live. The, the reality of us as human beings today, away from God or separate, separated from God, we are nothing but Neanderthals running around, scraping stones, um, killing each other. The reality is, is we would be eating one another for sustenance if there was no God. And, and this is mm -hmm. what, what the atheist doesn't realize. By removing God from the equation, there is no moral foundation to begin with. Absolutely. There is none. There's nothing. Um, and, and just to keep you guys uh, updated on our track of uh, plagues, uh, for the plague of flies, the Egyptian god that that matches to is the Egyptian god of creation, who is Kepri, um, which is uh, known by this being with a fly-shaped head. So this is an Egyptian god that, if you look at the hieroglyphics, has the head of a fly. Um, and so that's their god of creation. So now we've seen God basically say, uh, you know, basically mocking uh, the Egyptian god of water, the god of the Nile, the god of fertility the, with the frogs, uh, the god of the earth with the dust, and then, then the god of creation with the head of a fly. Mm. It's powerful. And, and this is ultimately what we see, even when we come to, to end time prophecy, the fulfillment of the messianic prophecies, the prophecies Jesus fulfilled, there's always these parallels. This is when we say, when we look at the books of Moses, even when it comes to the, the, the Levitical law, which is drawn out, there is, when we read it in its proper context, there is an explanation to why it went that badly south why these laws and rules were imposed on a people because no matter what God did, they continued to be disobedient. The prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 60, 60, I think it's 66, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient people. So we see no matter how many times God delivers Israel throughout the ages, it only takes a season or two for them to turn their backs on him. And, and, and again, this is, this is what we see, the, the beautiful parallels of, of Scripture and how reading Scripture in, in its full context, we can then go and make sense of what the Apostle Peter is saying, what the Apostle Paul is saying. Moreover, what Jesus Christ was saying to the Pharisees when he spoke in parables. 
we we can understand what he's saying because we've read all of God's word. So this is now chapter nine. Then Moses, uh, sorry, then the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. See, the instruction remains the same. God is not asking for anything. He's not saying, let the people go with half of your gold. Let the people go with half of your woman. None of these, none of these, he's, he's let them go so that they can serve me in the wilderness. This is the instruction. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. So yeah, God does it again. He shows Pharaoh a sign that should be like, okay, this is clearly, their God is clearly alive because all of their animals are are not dying and all of our animals are and the lord set a time saying tomorrow the lord will do this thing in the land and the next day the lord did this thing all the livestock of the egyptians died but no but not one of the livestock of the people of israel died and pharaoh sent and behold not one of the livestock of israel was dead but the heart of pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people go. Again, we see. Mm. I mean, God so, is so good. Uh, uh, just to interrupt before he continues. Um, so this one's an interesting one. So Hathor is the Egyptian goddess of love and protection. And usually the Egyptian goddess of love and protection, Hathor, was depicted with the head of a cow. Which, weird, that, that's where they drew that line. But uh, yeah. Definitely was. So just throwing it out there. Let me go ahead and scroll up for you. And man, you getting all the fun things I mean, now. Yeah, yeah, it gets yeah, it gets rough. It gets rough. I mean, now we're talking about physical, physical plagues happening to the people. Boils, the sixth plague. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from the kiln. And let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust all over the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout the land of Egypt. Notice whatever was left over, whatever cattle didn't die, whatever, <laughs> whatever they had turned full of boils, full of sores. So they took suit from the kiln. And stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it in the air, and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord had spoken. So again, God said this would happen. Moses and Aaron were fully aware that these things were going to take place. And even after these things took place, there would be no release of the people. Again, we're going to see God's final retribution with the final plague. We're going to see God's judgment. Um, and and this is where, where we see Pharaoh paying the price for what had been done at the time of Moses' birth. His people being slaughtered by the hundreds of thousands simply Amen. because simply because they were worried about the Hebrews growing stronger. Yeah. So let's look and, at the and, seven. And the, uh, just throw, throwing it out there again. Uh, so the God of Egypt that is being, um, insulted here or rebuked here uh would be isis who is the goddess of health and peace and what's the opposite of health and peace all the people <laughs> uh, uh covered in boils like seriously like that's the opposite of health and peace it, that's that's calamity and chaos I, oh that one's just oh my goodness i can't even imagine it can you imagine being one of the egyptians and and being really upset with pharaoh on this one like yo bro why is you doing this yeah yeah this is just like, man, like for, for anyone reading this, you, you, 
and I remember the first time going through the Exodus, I'm like, man, like just seeing this, just seeing this take place. How are you not like by plague three, I'd have been like, bro, take your people and pounce. Like things are just not looking good for, for Egypt right now. So anyway, we look at the seventh plague, which is hard hail. Um, and obviously Mike will touch on whichever God that is representing next. Oh, so, yeah, you can go ahead. I'll, I'll jump in after that. Cool. So then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. Again, the instruction remains the same. There's nothing added. There's nothing removed. For this time, I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and on your people so that they may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Just like I'm establishing myself i am the god who created you doesn't matter who you're serving i'm the one who made you bro and and this is this is what it comes down to for by now i could have put out my hand and struck you and all your people with pestilence and you had been cut off from the earth mm. but for this purpose i've raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth man i just love that Hey like, man, right? That's, bang that's that on the shelf, right there. Yeah, you, you so good. just highlight so, that one. Mm, man, 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 this is so good. So when people say, "Why does God do this? Why does God do that?" But for this purpose, He has raised up. Even we see the most demonic, crazy, Marxist, dominating dictators throughout the history of mankind. God has still used it for good. It, it people so don't beautiful. realize this like again this is where people try to step in and and, and play god like yeah. because to you this might not sound fair what do you mean but for this purpose I, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth it doesn't matter how you per perceive it it's the, the, uh, 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 it doesn't matter how you look at this and, and feel about it at the end yeah. of the day god is demonstrating his power through pharaoh by enacting his justice and at the end of the day you have, if you really think about it because god knows everything this is a genius thing for god to do because it also demonstrates to anyone who may challenge israel going forward what their god is capable of doing amen man amen i mean the very next verse he says it you are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go so again self self exalt you know he's self-exalting i am the pharaoh i am the god of this land i am the king um and god is saying no you're not you are created from dust and i healed the keys to life and death behold about this time tomorrow i will cause very heavy hail to fall such as has never been seen in egypt from the day that it was founded until now so even today egypt is not a place known egypt egypt is not a place known for it's desert it's it's dry it's not known for tropical thunderstorms and hail it's not known for that so god is saying this is this is what's going to happen it will not i'm going to drop down hail like it has never been never been seen now therefore send and get your livestock and all that you have in the field into safe shelter for every man and beast that is in the field and is not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. Then whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field. Notice, notice this. And as I've been waiting for this point. Notice how some of Pharaoh's very own people are starting to catch, you know, they're starting to get woke. <laughs> they're starting to see, okay, uh, he might not be seeing it, but we seeing it. Bro, I would have been on that page back at plague number three. I don't know how they lasted yeah. this long. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and they're like, they're cottoning on that, that the God of the Hebrews, he means business. And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the heaven so that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt on man and beast and every plant of the field. 
in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail. The fire ran down to the earth, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. And there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. Very heavy hail, such as had never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail? And then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. And Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail so that you may know that the earth is in the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. And the flax and the barley were struck down, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was in the bud. But the wheat and the emma were not struck down, for they are late in coming up. So Moses went out into the city from Pharaoh and stretched out his hands to the Lord and the thunder and the hail ceased and the rain no longer poured upon the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart. He and his servants so that the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people of Israel go just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. This is this is a, a beautiful depiction again. God said he would not listen. So if at any point he did listen, after God said he would not listen, that would again make God a liar. So again, when we speak of God being om omniscient, omnipotent, all-knowing, he knows the condition of the heart of man. Again, it's not, we're not saying that God has already pre-planned every single one of our steps. Tomorrow, decisions will be placed in front of you. This is why he says in Deuteronomy, I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses, choose life. So again, Pharaoh had the opportunity. He had the opportunity to do what was right. And you can see he's struck with remorse when he sees these people dying and he calls Moses and Aaron. And he's like, please let him go. Um, I've changed my mind. Let's, you know, they can, they can be gone. And then the moment it ceases, he's like, uh, nah, not going to happen. Not yeah. So, I mean, we see Pharaoh do this three times now where, I mean, honestly, I'm surprised Moses keeps going back to the Lord God with it because, uh, Pharaoh's obviously when things get crazy, he goes to Moses, he lies to him and then he hardens his own heart again. And, and I, you see, it's highlighted for those of you watching along with us, um, again, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. So I know that people get caught up on God hardening Pharaoh's heart, but we must understand that Pharaoh hardened his heart many times before God ever even had to harden his heart. Um, so it's not just God uh, hardening Pharaoh's heart. And now, as far as that plague, the seventh plague, which is the plague of hail, um, that is an insult to the goddess of the sky in Egypt, which is the goddess nut. Um, so this is the goddess of the sky. So again, we see things that, you know, the Egyptians praised their gods and they praise one of their goddesses who's in charge of all the sky. And the one true God is like, yeah, I'm in charge of the sky. I'm in charge of this. I'm in charge of that. Your false gods do nothing. Um, so let's roll into chapter, uh, what are we in? Chapter 10. 10. Awesome. Chapter 10. Um, let me check our time real quick and see where we're at. Okay. We're yeah, at I a good we should, we should do 10 and then, and then end it off because the 11, 12, 13, and 14 are important ones to unpack together. Yeah. We're getting into the Passover. We see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot to discuss. Yeah, we're gonna want to do that for the pa the Passover separately. Okay, guys. So let's let's yeah. go ahead and dive into chapter ten and let's bring this episode home. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants. And notice how right before this, and chapter 9 ended, it said, Pharaoh sinned again. Let me go back up there real quick. Let me go back up there. He sinned yet again and hardened his heart. And then here we see God saying, I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants. It almost goes hand in hand with what I've shared with you guys before that I believe every time we do things against God, we pull ourselves more away from God and we harden our own heart. So yes, God is hardening it by not pulling on it anymore. And at the same time, we sin against God, which pulls us in the opposite direction as well. He says that he has done that, that I may show these signs of mine among them. And that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I, how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them. That you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover the face of the land, so that no one can see the land, and they shall eat what is left to you and after, uh, left to you after the hail, and they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field, and they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and of all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen. From the day that they came on earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? So here's one of Pharaoh's servants like, Bro, do you not realize that your pride is getting our entire civilization destroyed? What are you doing? <laughs> I feel that. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. I want to stop for one second. One second. Previously, we see this happening uh, whenever the actual plague happens, and Pharaoh's kind of backed into a corner a, a bit and, and struggling with that. And he's like, You know what? Just go. But here, his servant is like, Hey, what are you doing, Pharaoh? And then he calls him back in and he's about to he's about to let them go, or at least <laughs> he's saying yeah. that. Yeah. Um, where was that? <laughs> then he turned and went out to Pharaoh. Then for, uh okay. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God. But which ones are to go? Moses said, We will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters and with our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. But he said to them, the Lord be with you. If ever I let you and your little ones go, look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, go the men among you and serve the Lord, for that is what you are asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day, all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts as had ever, I'm sorry, has, as had never been, uh, been before, nor ever will be again. They covered the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened and they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruits of the trees that the hail had left. Not a green thing remained, neither tree nor plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. I want to, I want to remind you real quick. Yeah. We have people that are still healing from boils, uh, a loss of cows because of what happened there, a loss of the fish because of the Nile, um, frogs dead and stinking up, and now all your crops are gone. Just want to throw it out there. Just want yeah. To think, things but you know, are also right another now. thing. Yeah, another thing we just have to point out uh, before we go too far and we miss it. I just want to point out the parallel here with what we see with Noah and the flood. 
God says, this has go, this is going to happen. It's never been seen and it will never be seen. So again, he does what God does is he executes judgment in a way that he hasn't before, but in the same way, he will never execute that same judgment again. The same way he promised never to flood the earth again. He, he says, this will be seen by this generation. These people will see it. These people will know that I am God. Notice he's doing this. He's saying, they will see. They will know. Um, and again, it won't happen again after this. So this is something that you have to put on the shelf when we look at all these stories. As we go through, even when we get to the time of judges, you will see God displays his power through his judges. But again, there are no judges today. This is why we still, this is an important part of, of if you if you follow the podcast, why we say prophets and apostles um, had their appointed time. And you will see this displayed throughout the Old Testament. If God said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If he said it won't happen again, it won't happen again. Amen. Let's continue. Not a green thing remained, neither tree nor plant of the field. Though uh, through all the land of Egypt, then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord, your God and against you. Now, therefore, forgive my sin, please only this once and plead with the Lord, your God only to remove this death from me. So he went out from Pharaoh and pleaded with the Lord. So here's uh, again, Pharaoh saying like, look, I can't do it anymore. I'm sorry. But this time it's a little bit different. And in, in the first couple of times, Pharaoh calls him in and says, hey, uh, plead with your Lord to have him stop. I'll let you guys go. Now it's like, hey, I've messed up. I've sinned against your God. Please forgive me. Uh, ask your God to stop this. So Moses and Aaron go and they do it. And it says, the Lord turned the wind into a very strong west wind, which lifted the locust and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people of Israel go. Then, oh, actually real quick. So the God or goddess that was being insulted here is Seth, the Egyptian God of storms and disorder. So uh, that is who is being insulted with the plague that happened with the locusts. Let's go next. Uh, the ninth plague, darkness. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. Like, hold on for a minute. Let's stop for two seconds and think about what's being said right there. He said a darkness to be felt, like a darkness that you and I probably can't even fathom. Um, you know how there's some places in the world that are truly like, I don't know if you know this, but not a lot of places are truly dark. I mean, they're dark, but like the truest form of dark, because there's always like some ambient light somewhere that's able to kind of shine into the area. But when you get true darkness, it actually can, can drive you crazy a little bit, right? Um, there's studies on this. Like if you're in a place where it's true darkness and you can't even see your own hands, if you're there for a while, it will drive you mad because without that vision, it, it's a, it's a confusing thing for your brain to really deal with. And this is what God is talking about. He said, a darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out. Oh, sorry. Let me pull that back up. Stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. Notice here, there was no warning for Pharaoh on this one. There was no, uh, hey, Pharaoh, let my people go, or this is going to happen. Just straight up this time, just jump straight to the, uh, to the plague. And it says they did not see uh, one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. And you have to understand if it's that dark that you can't even see other people, you wouldn't have left your home either. I mean, you can't see anything for three days. Oh, my goodness. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. When Pharaoh called Moses and said, go serve the Lord, your little ones also may go with you. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. But Moses said, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord, our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind for we must take of them to serve the Lord, our God. And we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. 
and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me, take care never to see my face again, for on the day you see my face, you shall die. Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. So that's the end of chapter 10. Uh, and, and let's talk about that last plague. So this last plague might not sound as crazy because to some of you, you might say, well, we got dead frogs, gnats, flies, locusts, all types of stuff. This is just darkness. You just lay in the bed. No, this is also an insult to the, one of the most important gods of the Egyptian gods, right? So yeah. if you know anything about the Egyptian gods, their, their main God, who is, who is, believed to be the pharaoh right that's why the word ra is usually in the pharaoh's title somehow um like ramses is ra mese um ra is the god of the sun and he is like the head god there's only one above him yeah. and that's amun ra um and he's the god of gods but so here the one true god yahweh is saying yeah you guys think ra is powerful i'm gonna I'm a block the sun out for three days so not mm. only is this a, a a pain for them in darkness but you're the person you think is the the greatest god the god you think that's in charge of everything can't even keep the sun in which he's the god of in the sky for you it, it's basically destruction of beliefs right like straight up yeah. Like you have no reason to even believe in your gods at any point in this for the Egyptians. So it's a dangerous Amen. strike. Um, and then and we also, also like, you, yeah, you also see that, that with, with this three days of darkness, every single one of Pharaoh's sorcerers and his magicians, they were able to mimic certain plagues. They were able to mimic certain signs, but they were not able to reverse anything. So you must understand Pharaoh's agitation and irritation with his own magicians and sorcerers because they're not able to reverse or undo what Moses has done. Here's also what Moses does. He, he, he says, this is what makes this so beautiful and, and so powerful. He proclaims the, the next plague before it happens every time. He says, this is going to happen tomorrow if you don't let the people go. So it's not like God's going, okay, bam, 10 plagues, locusts, flies, everything, darkness, all at once. He goes, I'm giving you yet another chance. I'm giving you yet another chance. And after every chance God provides, Pharaoh, here's what's coming. Imagine being this naive. Imagine being this arrogant that you know what's happening tomorrow. And some of your very own fellow Egyptians heed the warnings, they start pulling in their livestock, they start hiding in the shade, and uh, you still go, nah. And that's why, on, at, at the end of this, again, I just want to remind everyone who's, 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 who's been with us through this specific reading to please go and read. Once you've done gone through this, please read Romans 3 in its entirety because we see this hardening of Pharaoh's heart happening often. And again, God gives us over to Do what you mean our Romans nine. Design. Just throwing it out there real quick. Romans, no, no, no. That's that's the that's Israel's uh, blindness. I'm talking about um, the hardening of the heart. I'm talking yeah. about the hardening of the heart. Romans, isn't, yeah, isn't Romans, Romans nine 3. the hardening of Pharaoh's heart? Yes, yeah, he mentions it, but I'm talking about uh, mankind in general. If we look oh, at okay, Romans okay, okay. three, yeah, Romans three verses nine to twenty three. Also Romans five ten. And obviously also Romans one twenty four, where those who suppress the truth. Um, but again, when it comes to the hardening of a heart. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. And and that that's the end of chapter 10 right there, guys. And as you see what's coming up next, we have the final plague threatened. I don't think it's a spoiler to say it, that we all know what the final plague is. That's the angel of death, the firstborn of Egypt. This is the story of the Passover. I mean, this next episode is, I mean, we're talking about like, one of the most important uh, stories biblically. It is a story that is constantly retold over and over again. It is uh, a story that is upheld in the Jewish culture, the Christian culture. Uh, I don't think uh, Muslims talk about it because they don't even really have a, a real Old Testament. Uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> let me not let me not do that right now. 
Uh, but guys, make sure you are back Friday at 8 a.m. That is when it premieres every week. We are so thankful that you guys are tuning in with us and, and listening to this and taking this journey Amen. with us as we go through the Bible. We are, uh, you know, 10 chapters down in Exodus. So we only got, you know, 65 books and 20 chapters to go. So, I mean, uh, or 64 Easy. books and 20 chapters to go. So Easy peasy. <laughs> It's just going to be about, uh, about 37, 38 by the time we finish that. Oh, actually, no, I'll probably be older than that. I'll probably be 39 when we finish this. Yeah. I feel like it'll be about, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, guys. Especially as, as we go on, it's just there's just so much more to unpack. But praise Jesus that we are able. Yeah. By his grace, we can keep doing it, man. The New Testament's going to be so much. <laughs> so it's going to be much. so much fun, man. It's going to be so much fun. Amen. Hey, guys, thank you all for being here to the True Christian Ministry family. We love you guys, and uh, we just thank you for everything that you do. Uh, as always, Amen. God bless, and go in peace. <laughs>